Thank you. Um, and thanks for the kind words. Um, I really appreciate everyone who is here today um, by choice. I don't feel that I'm here by choice. Um, so anyone who is willing to work on um, tackling this problem who doesn't have the terrible motivation that I have, uh, I just admire you all and thank you. After our daughter Erica died of heat stroke and dehydration in the Catherine Thier Freer Wilderness Therapy, and I always have to say therapy with air quotes, <laughs> expeditions, we were shocked to learn from the sheriff investigating Erica's death that the Freer program was not licensed by Nevada Child and Family Services. We'd been sold a licensed program but Freer held only a certificate from the Nevada Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Treatment. Clearly what Freer Expeditions was doing, taking kids out on 21-day wilderness treks, fell under the Nevada regulations for outdoor youth programs, which date to the early 90s. Erica died in 2002. If Erica had had the physical, including drug screening, that was required under Nevada statutes for youth programs, she might have lived. After the state of Nevada became aware of the FUR program's presence in their state, FUR was ordered to cease and desist and it abandoned operations in Nevada. FUR is, however, still licensed in Oregon, its home state. State regulations for treatment, residential treatment programs for teens is, as the GAO reported, spotty and patchwork. Utah has the longest history of regulating teen programs, arguably the greatest number of programs, and has had the most documented deaths in residential programs. One man, one individual, has been part of writing the Utah statutes and has been in charge of enforcement for over 18 years. Uh, this Utah State Regulator, by example, is all I'm saying, has been often been seen as a greater ally to the industry than to the children the state is supposed to protect. Three days after the heat stroke of a young man named Ian August, the heat stroke death of a young man named Ian August, this Utah State official said that there was no indication that the program August died in violated any regulations. Shortly after criminal charges were filed in August's death, however, Utah regulators decided, regulators decided that there had indeed been violations of Utah regulations and the program's license was revoked. A little over a year later, the operators of this program were back in business in Utah with a new license. The director of that program said of August's death, it was an unfortunate thing that happened. It's just one of those things. In Montana, despite strenuous efforts by at least one state legislator to establish meaningful oversight for teen residential programs, the entire regulatory process was diverted when industry allies defeated an attempt to revise the makeup of the oversight board from a majority of industry representatives, three of five, to a majority of healthcare professionals, five of nine, Subsequent to that defeat, three members of the Oversight Board voted to choose a top official from the state's most notorious teen program to run the board. As one observer put it, forget about the fox guarding the hen house. In the case of the Montana Board of Private Alternative Adolescent Residential or Outdoor Programs, which is known as the PAARP, the fox is now running the whole rent-a-cop shop. Unfortunately, industry purveyors are frequently disproportionately represented in when local attempts are made to rein in residential programs. There's a lot of money at stake, and in such states as Utah, Idaho, and Oregon, industry representatives have been integrally involved in the legislative process. The rationale given was, quote, the states didn't understand exactly how different the private parent choice schools and programs were from the already existing schools and programs. In my opinion, this is a smokescreen for businesses that have operated with few, if any, standards and oversight, and when they see that regulation may be inevitable, desire the next best thing to no regulation, which is self-regulation. 
As far as federal responses, I'm going to repeat some, some things that have already been said, but um, in uh, Representative George Miller, now Chairman of the Education and Labor Board, has um, been working on this, I know, for a very long time. I don't even know how long. But in 2005, Representative George Miller, who was then the ranking minority member of what is now the House Committee on Education and Labor, introduced the End Institutional Abuse Against Children Act and also called on the Government Accountability Office to launch an investigation of private residential treatment programs for teens. In 2007, the GAO presented case studies of programs where deaths occurred, including my daughter Erica's, to the House Committee on Education and Labor with Representative George Miller, now as the chair. Chairman Miller and Representative Rahal asked the Inspectors General at the U.S. Departments of Interior and Agriculture to launch investigations into private residential treatment programs for children that operate on federal land. Several of the case studies presented by the GAO were ones in which the deaths occurred on federal land, including my daughter Erica's. Chairman Miller also asked the Federal Trade Commission to in investigate deceptive marketing practices by residential programs for teens. In 2008, the GAO details findings, detailed findings from the examination of eight additional cases and the results of the investigation of deceptive marketing tactics and questionable practices. Chairman Miller introduced the Stop Child Abuse and Residential Programs for Teens Act, which did pass the House um, last year with a bipartisan vote as H.R. 6358. Also on June 25, 2008, the Bureau of Land Management issued a new instruction memorandum whose purpose is to ensure that wilderness therapy or residential treatment programs for troubled youth operating under special recreation permits are appropriately using the lands and waters managed by the Bureau of Land Management, are adequately, adequately providing for the protection, health, and safety of children, participating in the programs and are in compliance with state licensing or registration requirements. In July of 2008, the Federal Trade Commission issued a brochure, which is in your packet, uh, include for questions for parents to ask about residential treatment for teens. Last week, Chairman Miller introduced the Stop Child Abuse and Residential Programs for Teens Act of 2009, H.R. 911, which passed out of committee by a 32-10 vote on February 11th. There's a one-page fact sheet about the legislation. Some of you, of course, know it better than I do, but uh, or any of us, but um, that is in your packet. So, um, I personally fervently hope that 2009 is the year that a Stop Child Abuse in residential programs for Teens Act is signed into federal law. If you or your organization has not written a letter of support for this bill, please consider doing so. When it comes up for a vote, please urge your constituents to contact their legislators for a yes vote. Thank you.